Hi, I'm Megan. And I'm Sarah. We're two moms with eight kids between us from preschool to teen. This is the show where we help you feel better about the mom you are and share our own parenting tips and personal stories. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 165 of the Mom Hour. I am Sarah Powers here, as always, with Megan Francis. Hi, Megan. Hey, Sarah. Excited about this topic today. It is a really good one. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about feeling criticized, feeling judged, yeah. which is like a ginormous topic. It really is. I feel like this could be like a whole season. <laughs> it could. You know, we this is sort of a through line of our show. A lot of moms say they listen to our show because we're non-judgmental or we kind of make it okay to you do you no matter what you're doing and that that's the culture we've tried to create. But at the same time, we don't have a lot of episodes. Actually, we have a couple, but way back in the archives that are actually devoted to this idea of judgment and criticism and more how we react to it as moms. I don't think we can ever stop it existing in the world, but maybe managing our own reactions. Absolutely. Love it. Um, Yeah. So we're going to offer our perspectives on getting feeling criticized, which is not always the same as getting or being criticized, right. which is definitely something I think we're both going to hit on. Um, but I know it's just going to happen sometimes, but if you kind of flip the script and come at it from a different angle, I know that's helped me a lot in my motherhood journey and hopefully will help you too. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited for this. Also wanted to mention that we have Katie Addis at the end of the show who comes on with me once a month and she's got always great tips, great discoveries. And she's also really honest about, you know, what life is like with now she has two toddlers. I used to say a baby and a toddler, but she's got a one and three year old. So um, she's in the thick of it. So listen all to all the way to the end and you will hear Katie and me. So that'll be fun. Well, let's start with our sponsor, Canvas People. This is one of my favorite sponsors, honestly, because I think over the last, like, I'm going to say 10 years, we've all gotten so much better at taking pictures Yeah, because we carry around these great cameras that are attached to our communication devices, right? And the cameras keep getting better. uh, They keep getting better and better. So I have beautiful photos I've taken of my kids over the the years. What I have not gotten better at or have gotten much worse at is actually printing those photos which means I never display those photos. So I have so many photos that are just like basically, unless I scroll back to the beginning of um, smartphone history, that are just lost to time. And that makes me really, really sad. So what I love about Canvas people is they take those photos of yours. Those really, you know, those ones you grab after you've been like at the beach or whatever it is, and you grab that photo that you feel so good about. And they make these beautiful prints of them on Canvas. And it is truly a work of art because not only is it, it's just more interesting to look at a canvas print, I think, than a framed photo. Yes. Um, but they're big and it's just a great way to, if you're looking for something to hang on a wall, we always say like, if you can't get a room to feel like it has some personality, get something and hang it on the wall. Yeah. And canvas people is a great way to do that um, because they really are like pieces of art. So this is a fantastic offer. We have a special code you can use to get 11 by 14 canvas people for print for free. That is a $69.99 value, so $70 value, and all you have to do is pay the shipping and handling. That's amazing. Again, it's a huge print. I got mine, and it, it's nice-sized. Um, so just go to canvaspeople.com, upload your photo, and enter the special code MOMHOUR. So again, this is a limited-time offer. You're going to want to check it out. Go to canvaspeople.com and use the code MOMHOUR, and you're going to get that 11 by 14 print for free if you just pay the shipping and handling. This is such good timing too, because I feel like we've done quite a bit this summer with my kids. And the sometimes I take a really great picture. Of course, I post it to Instagram because hello, but then I forget yes. about it. Um, yep. And pretty soon the summer's over. We're going to go back to school. So I love that this is a way to just get it off the phone and onto the wall for yep. free, guys. This is such for a free. good deal. Love it. Okay. So Guys, the way we've kind of structured this is we're going to go back and forth, Megan, and we're going to offer different ways to think about. So I'm calling this when you feel criticized, remember this. So these are kind of core things you can remember or perspective to have when you feel judged, criticized, shamed as part of motherhood. Um, So I'll go first, Megan, if that's cool with you. Yeah, go ahead. And so my first thing to remember when you feel criticized is it's okay to feel sad it's okay to feel mad. I feel like I'm talking to a toddler. This sounds like a Dr. Seuss book. It is. It (laughs) is. Or Mr. Rogers. It's it's what we say to our kids when they're having big emotions. But I think as moms, sometimes we skip those feelings and we get right to the part where we're like saying, oh, I'm too sensitive. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be taking this so hard. Or we kind of are, um, 
our defensiveness goes up and we're like, yeah. well, I don't care what that person thinks anyway. And so we we kind of skip over the real feelings of it hurts yeah. to feel judged or criticized and it can make you mad. And I think just like we say to our kids, um, it's it's really important to take time to acknowledge those feelings. And I don't mean like you have to write a poem about it or like have a whole therapy session. I just mean that what I think what we resist is what kind of persists. And I didn't make that up, but you know, it helps my, no, my one actually... kid who ruminates on things. So, <laughs> you know, take a minute to like really recognize sad and mad feelings before you try to move on and rationalize and, you know, do all these other great tips that I'm sure we'll have for you today. Yeah. I was actually just going to say that like every time I try to suppress what I'm feeling and tell myself um, that I'm taking something too seriously, I get more defensive. Yeah. Like, it's like, because me telling myself I have no right to feel a certain way then makes me almost feel that feeling harder. It's, yeah. Or, it's a weird, or it goes yeah. into kind of like a beating yourself up for even having the feelings in the first place, which yeah. we all do that, but it's not healthy. Um, and you know, the, the good coaches and therapists will tell you that like, there's no bad, there's no feelings that are wrong. Feelings right. are just feelings. So if you it's it's still, I think, great to examine maybe why you feel that way or why you're particularly sensitive in that area. And that's something I think we're going to get into later yeah. in the episode. But just have the, just feel the feels, I guess, is my yeah, first feel, kind of allow tip. yourself to feel your feels. That's a great tip. Um, OK, ready for me to go? Yeah. OK, so my first one is that everyone, literally everybody, and I mean it literally, literally, not literally, figuratively, <laughs> um, feels judged at some point in some way of their lives. So that includes the mom who seems to have like the most perfect life. That includes the mom who's been doing this a long time. Like me, um, every single new phase of motherhood has opened up like a new opportunity for me to doubt myself. Mm -hmm. And that often leads to projecting other people's opinions <laughs> onto what I feel about my own opinions or my assumptions about their opinions. So I, I just think there's really nobody out there who hasn't felt this mm -hmm. um, and who isn't feeling it right now. Mm -hmm. Like everybody is. And that includes the moms who are maybe judging. That's, yeah, you know, especially like, maybe. yes, especially. And not only has everyone felt judged, I'm going to go on a limb and say everybody has judged, even yep. if they didn't mean to. Um, or didn't dwell on it or didn't make it apparent. It just, it's a part of the human experience. Mm -hmm. And I do think that, you know, speaking of projecting, I, the times of my life that I have felt the most judged have also been the times I've been doing the most judging. Mm. And it's kind of a chicken or egg thing. Like it's hard to say where it started and where it stopped, but it's mm -hmm. like that vicious cycle of once you're judging, you're more, th you're in that judging mindset. So you're more susceptible to being judged. And mm -hmm. On the other side, I feel like the more time you spend thinking about or fixating on the fact that maybe someone else is judging you, the more you kind of want to lash out defensively yeah. to judge them back. So wherever you fall right now in the cycle, like I'm picturing in my head one of those circles with like the arrow. Yeah. <laughs> where it's like on the left is like judging and then like right around noon, it's like or 12 o'clock, it's like judged, you know, and yeah. it just goes round and round. And sometimes it's really hard to get off that train, but you can't stop other people from judging you. The only thing you have power over is how you react to it and then how you uh, internalize and interpret your feelings about whatever they're doing. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions to go sure. deeper with this one. Cause this is like a big one that I don't want to gloss over. First of all, can you, cause not all of our listeners know your backstory. Can you maybe yeah. give an example of a period of, I think mm -hmm. I know what you'll say, but a period oh, yeah, of time you know. where you were in this judgy mm -hmm. cycle and maybe what the circumstances were. Sure. Um, okay. So this was like early internets, early interwebs. It was around the, it was late, late nineties. And, um, you know, when I had Jacob, I was fairly crunchy, but I didn't know that that was a thing. Like, I just didn't know that, you know, taking your baby to bed with you and like, like kind of attachment parenting e practices were mm -hmm. like a thing that right. you could find on the internet. <laughs> oh yeah. I like, yes. I like to say I fell in with a group of, um, like a militant crunchy group. And at first it just seemed like all of this like treasure trove of information and like these new ways of doing things. And for a short period of time, I actually felt like I'd found a comfortable home and I felt less defensive about mm -hmm. my choices because I had this group of people that were doing things the similar ways that I was. And it was probably a great, um, it was a great buffer against maybe judgment you'd have from the real outside world. Exactly. That, like, yeah. That's exactly what I mean. Who maybe didn't support extended yeah. breastfeeding or cloth right. diapering or whatever. Yeah. So I can yeah. see how that would happen. So it was like this 
you know, comfy little haven for a while where I could just kind of be me and like talk openly about the things that I was doing and, you know, just lots of different things that um, I was immersed in at that time. And I think sometime around the time I had Isaac was when I kind of fell overboard. And that was when it wasn't enough for me to, you know, get re like get some validation on a choice or get some information I might, might not have gotten elsewhere and then feel good about my choices because people were supporting me. It became almost more like now, what more can I do? Like, what more can I do to fit this group, to fit in with this group? And, and the group had a really judgy overtone or undertone, whichever one that, that was not always apparent, but would kind of like, if you were just like kind of looking in from the outside, you didn't always see it right away. And then it would flare up in these most like epic of internet um, battles. And this mm -hmm. was back in the bulletin board days. And I got like to a point where I would judge people only because I knew I was being like judged or that's the way I would, you know, that's, that's where the cycle started for yeah. me. Like I knew if I didn't do X, this group of people would judge me for it. Therefore, if anyone else didn't do Y and I did do Y that gave me license to judge them. And it was very insidious the way it snuck in. I didn't even see it coming. Um, and I basically had to, I mean, I would say around the time William was born was when I kind of just divorced myself from, I'm, I'm still actually friends with a lot of these people, but the group dynamics yeah. were, were like a no go for me. And that was because, you know, I had three kids all of a sudden yeah. and I was working and there were things that I, there's choices I had to make and things I had to do just to get by. And I really literally did not have time to worry about what anybody else thought. I love um, that. I think yeah. the third kid for both of us is when we're like, well, I, I don't <laughs> yep. have time to worry about that anymore. Yeah, and I, exactly. I, but I want to and, say, and oh, oh, sorry, one other thing. And I will say also being a single mom for a while um, in that, at that early stage when Jacob was uh, like four and Isaac was two was another big moment for me where I was like, I need people's help and support in real yeah. life. I don't have time to worry about what these internet people think of me. And that was, it's so funny looking back now that that was ever a thing mm -hmm. because I'm so much more confident now and stuff, but everybody goes through it. Like yeah. everyone in some way has to get there. And even though we're talking about almost 20 years ago in internet life, Facebook groups are, are all the rage right now with yes. new moms. And so the, it can't be that much different. I think some, the, I think the best Facebook groups are well moderated and have some kind of core yeah. values in place, but <laughs> yeah. this stuff is still happening. And so it the, is. the two things that came up for me when you were talking is number one, Whenever you have a group of people sort of committed to a a collection of values or a lifestyle, well, it could be anything. And we see this in our political climate. We see it yep. all over the place. Um, it's it's just way too easy to be lazy and like you're either in or out. And if you're yeah. in, you do all of the things on this. The whole menu. laundry you list. You do all yep. of it. Like all, <laughs> yeah. here's your attachment parenting checklist or your whatever it is checklist. Um, and then if you don't do those things, you are riddled with self-doubt and, you know, risk being ostracized. That's This is how this like tribe dynamic works. Now, yeah. I think, like you said, there could be real value in finding your people who have a similar mindset. So it's really tricky to kind of figure out where does this become um, sort of mom shaming or judginess and where is it a supportive community? And I think when you're a new mom, it's just really hard to know because like you yeah. said, you feel validated by having a group of like-minded people. Um, so I don't know. I just think that that's, it's really important. If you have found a tight knit group, I would just say to be, be aware of what things feel supportive and what things feel sort of exclusive or like, um, what am I trying to say? Like deal breakers, like you're in yeah. or you're out. Um, and, and if I, your gut tells you people are being abusive, it's cause they are. I mean, that's yes. the other thing. Like if you feel like it's a cult or like you don't get, you don't get to be yourself because you don't get to express an opinion that differs from the, it, it's bad. Get out. Like, yeah. that's the only thing I could, you know, that would be like, I wish I had done that a year before I did. Yeah. I remember, and, yeah. I remember this conversation with a mom. I didn't know very well. She was like the wife of someone that was hanging out with my husband and they were visiting from the Boston area where there was a plethora of natural parenting and crunchy communities and resources. And I remember saying to her that in Arizona, where I was at the time, I felt pretty crunchy and I'm not really that crunchy, but I breastfed longer than a year. Um, I, you know, just certain little things. And, um, I remember saying to her, like, it's a little lonely sometimes because I feel like, you know, I don't there's not a lot of people interested in some of the parenting things I'm interested in. And she said, well, you might just want to be thankful for what you have, because let me tell you what kind of a competitive <laughs> yeah. it's like com it's like a competitive sport. And I and I'm sure that's kind of similar to what 
you experienced too. And I had yeah. never thought about it. I just thought, well, wouldn't that be great to be surrounded by people who are baby wearing and this yeah. and that? And she was like, well, but maybe not. Sometimes, sometimes it's not so bad to be like the kind of, you know, somewhat quirky outsider. Yes. I think there's some advantages. I think to there's that. advantages to that over being like the person who's lagging behind um, the group of yes. quirky people who have become the norm. And because there is a, there's a lot of temptation to push it, yeah. push it, push it. And I, I remember, you know, reading stories about like birth experiences and it was almost like the weirder things went and I'm using weird <laughs> as totally without judgment because, yeah. or with judgment. I don't even know. I mean, I had home births and I, you know, I did some fairly weird things on <laughs> that would be considered weird to like a typical hospital birth person. But to me, like my perspective is yeah. so it's different that continuum. like to me, they're just like basically like home birth light. Yeah. Um, but there were people, you know, doing things like uh, skirting the edges, the extremes. And like you almost, it would become kind of addictive, like reading these stories and being like, how much weirder will this birth yeah. be than the last one? You know, how, like how long is she going to carry the placenta around or whatever it is. And you get to the point where you start to really lose perspective about how many people don't do these things. Like yes. it's, a, it's a pretty limited group of people. So it can start to feel a lot bigger than it actually is. Yes. Yes. And yeah. I think we've, we've said in the show before that it takes a while to realize you can cherry pick. And it's just yeah. so when you're brand new, it just feels like once you're on a bus, whether it's the attachment parenting bus or the working mom bus or whatever, then you're like on it and it's moving and you're doing what everybody else on the bus is doing. And it's just, it just takes time to realize you truly can, it's a buffet. You can cherry yeah. pick. Yep. Yep. So I don't know. I felt like that was worth a little deeper. No, I totally there. agree. I do agree. Um, okay, is it your turn? Yeah, it's my turn. But this is funny because I wrote it up and I'm totally just going to like quote you back at yourself because you okay. wrote a really <laughs> great post. I looked it up. It was in 2012, which is not as old as some of the things. We Gosh, read. it's a long time ago, it is, though. Six years ago. <laughs> um, and so what I'm going to say about what to remember when you feel criticized is it's always worth examining why we feel particularly vulnerable or sensitive about certain things. And I'm not saying that it's all about you and the person didn't mean it. And so sometimes people just are mean and judgy. So I want to say that first of all. But if you find yourself continually feeling sensitive or criticized in a particular area, I think it's really interesting to look at why that might be and just recognize that you have what you called it in the post, Megan, was your parenting Achilles heel. And I'll link up the post in the show notes. But basically, you talked about having kind of gotten a reputation as a teenager of someone who's flaky or irresponsible for better or for worse. Yeah. And that stayed with you into motherhood. So anytime something came up that could appear that you didn't have your, you know what together, you, you were defensive before anyone even criticized. And I yeah. totally relate to that. Not about that. In fact, sometimes I relate to that as the opposite. Like I have a <laughs> reputation for being uptight. So anytime I am given a chance to like prove that I'm not, or that if I feel like I'm being accused of being uptight, then I go right. overboard. You know, it's the same thing. So figure that out, just whether it's through like journaling or just, I don't know, self-examination because, and the reason I think it's worth looking at is if you're continuing to get your feelings hurt over a, a pretty similar uh, theme, yeah. it, it can just be helpful to say, okay, this is me reacting to this particular thing. And while that person might've been a little rude, um, I'm bringing a whole like suitcase full of baggage to this. Um, and maybe we can separate those two things and the hurt doesn't sting quite as much. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally. Um, I had forgotten about that post and then I went and looked at it and I forgot that it was, and tell this is like funny how time softens things or yeah. time makes things seem like, why did I worry about that so much? I had completely forgotten that Clara's top two teeth were really decayed. They came in early mm -hmm. and were never really good. And I took her to a dentist when she was a baby, like under a year old. And he told me, you know, sometimes it just happens. They came in early. The enamel didn't develop right. Not your fault, but we don't want to pull them until she's three. So she walked around for two years with like really bad front teeth. And I felt terrible about it. Like for two years, like mm -hmm. she had the most adorable little baby smile. And then I felt bad because I felt like people would be looking at me thinking I didn't brush my kids' teeth. You gave her and Coke and bottles. <laughs> like I gave her Coke and bottles and then like, yeah. So it's, yeah, or like a pacifier dipped in sugar. Remember <laughs> people talking about that from like the olden days. But anyway, I, I just look back now and of course I understand why I felt that way. Like she was an extension of me. She was everywhere I went. I had this baby and then toddler, you know, on my hip. Yeah. And people looked at her and she had that big smile and like, 
And, you know, people would be like, what's wrong with her teeth? Like, I remember multiple people asking and like, you don't really want to get into, well, you know, they came in at two months and yeah, just, you didn't, and they were, they didn't have a sufficient enamel. If you'd like to speak to my pediatric dentist, right. his number is here. Yeah. He's really great about returning calls. And I promise you, I'm seeing him every six months. I mean, like, yeah. you feel like you, like you have to go into this big explanation. And then when she was three, they got pulled out and it was never a thing again. Like, yeah. well, except then everyone thought they just got punched out or something. So I still got tons of comments after they were removed, but right. I would just go, yep, they got pulled and then move on. Um, but it's just funny how now that's like, I'd forgotten about that because yeah. it's so not a factor anymore, yeah. which I think is when you're feeling judged, uh, just remember like in two years, you probably won't even remember what you felt judged about in the first place. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure our listeners can relate to having those specific areas that feel more um just tender than others yeah so of course just yep. just helpful to know what they are okay let's take a quick break and talk about our sponsor hydrolite i'm excited about this one so a few weeks ago my family got hit with a summer stomach bug which just seems like adding insult to injury it's so mean it's so mean world <laughs> um but I'm really happy to have found out about Hydrolyte. I wasn't familiar with it before, but it's a great tasting clinical hydration product that has all the right balance of sodium, glucose, and water to replace those fluids and electrolytes that you lose when you're sick or if you're running around like crazy. But what it doesn't have is all the extra sugar that we yeah. know comes in the popular sports drinks. So they have great flavors like orange and berry and lemonade. And what's cool is you can get it as a pre-mixed drink in a bottle, just like you would get a sports drink but also a powder or these little effervescent tablets you can drop into a glass of water. And those are great for travel, for on the go, for, you know, sports tournaments. It is hot right now where both you mm. and I are. And I don't know, do you notice when your kids are dehydrated? I do. Like I can just. Oh yeah. They get grumpy. They yes. get headaches. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So um, staying ahead of hydration is super important, whether it's just sickness or summer or whatever. So Hydrolyte's available um, in the digestive aisle at Rite Aid or online at Amazon. And so if you guys head to hydrolyte.com slash podcasts, that will take you actually to their Amazon store. And it's 30% off if you use the promo code HydraKid. I went through and made sure all that worked. Um, again, it's hydrolyte.com slash podcasts. And then that saves you 30% off their Amazon store when you use the promo code HydraKid. The promo code happens kind of like when you set up your payment information. It's it's yeah. uh, it's through their Amazon store. So there is a place for that promo code to save 30%. So go check that out, HydraLite. I love the tablets. You can throw yeah. them in your in your beach bag or your purse or in a drawer in the kitchen. Very convenient. Totally. Okay. So should we get back to yeah. judgment? Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess it's my turn to go now. Yeah. Okay. So keeping, you know, things to keep in mind when you're feeling judged. And this is another time I'm going to make a grandiose statement. You ready? <laughs> ready? Do we need music? A, da, 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 da. I kind of feel like we do. We need to have Johnny add some, some grandiose music here. Um, I have literally never. Now, again, I mean that literally, literally Yep. <laughs> made a good parenting decision based on what someone else thought. Or I'm going to put this forward again, what I thought they thought, mm. because I do think sometimes perception of what other people think about you and reality are not the same. And it's not always easy to sort out. But like, that's probably the number one thing. Like, is someone judging you? Ask yourself, wait, are they really judging you? Yes. Or are you just feeling judged because you're sensitive, like yes. you said before? Um. So this is a hard one, though, because we are social creatures mm -hmm. like there's a reason we hang together in packs <laughs> and there's a reason that we take advice from the people who are close to us yeah. and want to make choices that other people support. I mean, that those are all important parts of living in a society or a tribe. Um, but when it really comes down to it, once I've made up my mind, like where I'm going, um, why I'm doing what I do what path I'm on, et cetera. If I step off it to make someone else happy, I am not going to be happier as yeah. a result. And I'm not going to be a better parent as a result. So I guess the, the first step to that is doing the thinking and the in, like intention setting to mm -hmm. begin with, like knowing what kind of parent you are and understanding yourself and understanding where the balance lies between making yourself happy and functional and, you know, filling your own bucket and, what kind of parent you would like to be mm -hmm. in a, in an ideal world. And then in the real world, I mean, there's a lot of like kind of thinking that has to go into that yeah. and soul searching, but I feel like 
the more we kind of focus on what kind of parent we want to be and why we're doing what we do, Mm -hmm. why we're in this whole like mothering thing in the first place. Why are we here? You know, we're, we're all here to some degree by choice. So why, what is it about having kids that, you know, why do we do it in the first place? And when you really look at it from that, like big picture perspective, it makes it easier. I won't say easier, Mm -hmm. the easier to stick to your guns about stuff and to not get derailed. And I mean, again, it's like getting confident in your parenting um, takes action. It takes making the choices that you want to make over and over and over. And that's like flexing a muscle. Like the more you practice, the easier it gets. Sometimes you have to fake it till you make it. Um, and that's that muscle becomes stronger and stronger, but sometimes the weight feels heavier yes. than other times. Yeah. Well, I so I had two things to say, and one of them sure. was related to that, and that is to just practice. That I I feel like I'm in kind of a fun stage right now, where you know I'm past the really hard baby stage, but we're not into teenage years yet, and I almost get a kick out of now just deciding that I want to do things a little differently than someone else around me or than the you know mainstream parenting culture, and just. Yeah declaring it and doing it and it feels good but it it takes a long time to get there so as much little practice as you as you have as you can have about taking those stands little big whatever and sticking to them no matter what it it is at flexing a muscle so i was going to say that but also another thing that i think makes this really hard is like the quantity of information available because if you yeah. really truly are on the fence about a decision like let's say you have a baby that's on the smaller side and you are hearing from all different sides about whether or not to supplement with formula. I'm just making that up. I didn't, I did, that, that's not one from my experience, but I know it's a common one. You can find arguments for and against and, and in the middle, like, <laughs> at, like for forever, you could yeah. go down like the, the never ending rabbit hole and never get closer to a decision. What's right for you. So, I mean, intuition and, you know, kind of looking inside is helpful, but also what's helpful, especially when you're brand new is finding a very short list of people you trust. And that could include on medical issues. It's going to include your pediatrician, your healthcare provider, um, your whatever it is, but yeah, don't listen to us for that stuff. Yeah. It should be a short (laughs) list, honestly, Yeah, because then I feel like, and, and I'm, um, I'm more of a, an authority seeking person. I like rules and I like someone to tell me what the right thing is. So when you're in those more uncertain times, it might be false. I mean, no one pediatrician is the world's best pediatrician either. They're all flawed and they all have their own biases. But if you sort of declare your short list of trusted advisors and then really lean on them and go with go with their recommendations as well as your own gut then you can tune out the rest and i think it's it's really hard to make a quote unquote like good decision when there's so much available information it's so hard yeah i totally agree and i i know you've probably i i went the route where i read everything there was to read about different parenting you know, choices and pregnancy and all that stuff for like the first two or three years. And then I basically kind of stopped for a couple of reasons. A, I don't think things have changed right since then. Like I got all the information I need. You're, I'm good. Um, I'm good. Um, I talk to well-informed people. Yeah. And that's another really good way to get information. Of course, you don't just want to take hearsay, but like if you are hearing things coming from a friend who's really good at filtering and then you can decide what's worth yeah. reading an article about, I think that that can really help. Um, you know, calm that information overload feeling. And also I just, I felt like I got to a place where I wasn't going to read any one more piece of data. I had already by that point gone through data cycles where opinions had, I have, I had witnessed in front of my eyes, yeah. opinions, medical opinions, um, data driven opinions changing like mm-hmm. in front of my eyes. And I think I just became a little skeptical that it was ever going to change in a way that I would, I'd feel any more confident about right? <laughs> everything from feeding. And we were just talking about this, you know, pretty recently, like how feeding, um, yeah. recommendations have probably changed three or four, maybe five times since yeah. I started having kids. So the doctors today aren't any smarter than the doctors 20 years ago. They might have access to better research, but that's not necessarily the case. The research could be affected by things I don't truly understand. And I right. think it's just like, it becomes that sort of how much information do I need to make the best decision I can without 
second guessing literally everything I do. Can can um, I ask another yeah. or let's let's um talk about this a little since we ended up in this place of like research and data driven yeah. stuff. Um one thing I find is tricky is um if you so let's say you have made a decision about feeding your baby a certain way. Um sometimes even just communicating that decision in casual conversation um forget about feeling judged for a second. It almost can feel like you're the one judging because if you have taken a stand a certain way, even if you're just like, Oh, this is what we're doing. The implication, or it feels like the other person could feel like, well, are you better than me? Like, are you, you know? So I don't know if you remember that of being on the flip side of like not wanting other people to feel like you're judging them. I know I have felt that with a couple of things in particular where I'm like, Oh, well, this is just how we do it. But no judgment like you do again I really do yeah. have no judgment but that's hard because you kind of feel like if you're making a decision yeah. then it's easier for others to infer that yeah well two, so valid. yeah two two point parts to that answer I guess one is I decided early on the least said the better about any of it yeah I don't I don't share birth stories with people I don't know very well that is a trap <laughs> and I know that sounds terrible but like I feel like there's kind of no way for me to describe the births that I had without coming off, especially if I'm talking to people who had very, very different births. Like Mm -hmm. I know in a lot of ways I was lucky that nothing, you know, that I had really healthy pregnancies and easy births. And that's not something I can easily, um, I don't know, kind of explain away. Yeah. And just, and then I don't want anyone to feel like they have to justify to me. So if someone starts telling me their story about, for example, how uh they had an emergency cesarean under super like scary circumstances because their doctor said their baby's head was way too big to ever come out i in my gut feel like that's probably horse pucky like mm-hmm. their baby's head probably was not so big that they could not ever get it out but i don't know the circumstances that led to that yeah. and i would i would literally never share anything about my birth in that circumstance yeah. unless someone totally like asked me point blank point blank. Like, and because I don't want to come off as glib. I don't want to come off as judging. I don't want to come off as thinking I know better than their doctor. And I know there's like a lot of complicated things that lead to any one circumstance. So I just don't, I just don't talk about it. Now, when I do, if it comes up like in a group of friends or, or if I'm the one who talks about it first, because sometimes stuff like that just comes up Mm -hmm. and there's nothing you can do about it. I've just kind of decided like, I can't really take responsibility for the way someone else's, someone else feels about my experience. I can only talk about my experience in the most general offhand casual possible way or experience or choice. Like I probably honestly wouldn't even use the phrase, this is how we do things. Right. Because I feel like there's inherent implied judgment there, even though it's never meant like you could listen, hear that. And be like, what do you mean? This is how we do things. Right. So you know what I mean? Right. So I just, I don't even talk about it. I don't talk yeah. about that stuff. And and maybe that's not the right thing. Like maybe, maybe that's, maybe I'm being kind of wimpy about it, but I just have so many years under my belt now of yeah. seeing how it plays out on both sides that I just want to get to know people for who they are. Yeah. Uh, not for how they feed their babies or um, well, diaper their babies or and birth I think their babies. What you and I can both attest to is like those first decisions are so upfront and in your face. I mean, right. The way you feed and diaper your baby is on public display a lot of the time. So it's right. It's right there as well as, you know, how you're choosing to deal with behavior issues or discipline. It's so public. Um, birth ne- isn't necessarily, I mean, you would have to tell your birth stories, but I feel like that goes away after like yeah. three or four oh, years. Yeah. That's so, such a good point. So yeah, like, like everyone's yeah. back on the same playing field and like, yeah, if you got to know someone really well or you were swapping old war stories, you could elect to go into a discussion of what breastfeeding was like for you or why you chose formula or why you had a home birth right. or whatever. But you would be opting into that conversation in in most cases, um, as opposed to just having it right out there for the world to see. So let's file that one also into like it just gets easier as you go. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And I will also say, you know, and, and the uh, breastfeeding and formula feeding is probably I mean. Of all the public parenting things, when you're in your most vulnerable, that is probably it, right? Yeah. Like, if you're breastfeeding your kids around people who uh, don't ever want to see an errant nipple, uh-huh. you feel uncomfortable. If you're formula feeding and you're out in public, you have no idea what people think about formula feeding, and it's easy to feel really judged. And actually, Jacob was um, formula fed, at least supplemented, and 
uh, for the, you know, after probably three or four months. And then after that was pretty much exclusively formula fed after like six months. So I did not extend it nurse him. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of reasons that led to that, which are irrelevant and don't matter. Um, but I do remember that feeling like I should have a sign on me. Yeah. That's like, I tried promise yep. or like, get out of my face and <laughs> leave me alone. Even before someone had even looked at me or said anything. And yeah. I, yeah. And I think now it's so funny that like nothing I do, everything I do now is kind of behind closed doors almost right. like it, no one really knows. And it, right. it's so in your, it's so in everyone's face when your babies are little, Yeah, like up to, I would say like three or four. Yeah. That was the age yeah. that came to mind for me. Too. Yeah. Um, I mean, if they're not potty trained yet, people can tell they're in diapers. If yep. they still have a pacifier, people can see it depending on what kind of discipline you use. That's going to play out in public. Yep. Like it really doesn't come become until later that those become more private. And let me also say there's on the flip side of that, there is a loneliness to having yes, older kids and having everything be so that. private. So yeah. there's not necessarily like one phase that's better or worse. I just think when it comes to being judged for like, like a snap decision, if you are a new mom or like up to three or four, you are in the thick of it and it will get better. Yep. And I think our listeners are probably already doing this so well, but you can just, you can remember your first tip from today, Megan, which is everyone is feeling judged. Yeah. Um, but number two, you, you might be seeing someone on their best day or their worst yeah. day and you have no idea where they are along that continuum. So yeah, the same, the same um, grace we would want for ourselves could probably be applied in most cases. Okay, yeah. I think we should move on to what my next one. Okay. Um, which I am going to start with a quote from the music man, which is actually like a quote from a proverb. And that is that friends, the idle brain is the devil's playground. <laughs> Trouble. So what I mean by this is it, in the new, in the first couple of years, especially th it's easy for all this stuff that you feel judged about to become kind of your whole, your whole world. So let's say we're talking about sleep training or not sleep training. Let's say we're talking about the issue of, you know, co-sleeping or letting your baby cry it out or something in between. If you are already struggling with that decision and you're feeling a little bit judged by your peers and then you're spending pretty much all of your free time reading blog posts about it, books about it, doing research about it, talking to your partner, your spouse about it. Yeah. And if I sound like I know what I'm talking about, it's quite possible you because do. I've done <laughs> this. Then that is like that has now like taken up all the available space in your brain, which makes any offhand comment about sleep by another mom, yes. even if it's not meant at all toward you or at all judgmentally, it's like right there on the surface for you. So you can't help but not take it personally or send you yeah. into some spiral where you're questioning your every decision. You've basically created a soup. Yes. <laughs> like a primordial soup where you're growing like, yes, like you're... fungal spores that are just waiting. Right. So, and yeah. so even though, yeah, there might be a judgmental comment out there or a mom who disagrees, but you're going to be so primed to see it that you're going to be seeing. It's like the carpenter thinks the hammer's a solution for everything, right? Like right. you're going to see sleep everywhere you look. So the alternative to that is to make sure that you're filling your brain and your mind and your life with things outside of motherhood. And I didn't take this advice very well. I'm giving this advice to my, I was not very good at this. I'm better about it now. But if you have, you know, a good book that you're reading, a good TV show that you're watching, plans with friends to talk about stuff that's not kids, plans with friends who don't have kids, exercise, hobbies, like we talk mm -hmm. about this stuff all the time. The more balanced your um, media intake is and just your activity balance is the less those little comments are going to feel like they were like directed Toward laserly you. at you. Yes. Does that make I, sense? So I totally I don't want to say like get a life, but kind of in a loving way, make sure that you are getting a life or at least on the path to getting a life outside of that, that those, these baby issues. Well, that, that actually leads up perfectly to my last thing to remember, cool. um, which is kind of a, I guess, backing up and just looking at this all from the bird's view, um, you know, in the first, in my first tip, I think I, I referenced the cycle, like the judgment mm -hmm. cycle yeah. and how, whether you're judging or feeling judged, the first step is getting off the cycle. Like mm -hmm. if you don't step off, you know, the roller coaster, it's just going to keep going around and around with you in it. So the question is, how do you do that? And you just said it like, get a life yeah. and, and, and create a life. And so I think both both the non-parenting stuff, so the stuff that fills your brain with with energy and 
data that's not about parenting. Yeah. And that's like a really important piece of it, but also like just creating a life that feels good for you. So again, like looking with intention at the way you really want to do things, not the way you think other people would want you to do things, but the way you, mm -hmm. you, and maybe to some degree your partner, unless you're totally not seeing eye to eye on those things, in which case <laughs> maybe have your own and he can have his, um, but just create that life that feels good for you because really the more time and energy you're expending toward making something great. Yeah that feels really good. Um, and then enjoying that life, then the less time and like literally again, gosh, I'm using that word a lot, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm meaning it in only the most literal sense, the less time and energy you'll have to worry about what other people think. Yeah. It's Assuming like, you, I, they even think what you think they're thinking. Right. Exactly. Which <laughs> yeah. is questionable. I, I, I right. have this mental image of like a force field barrier, like yeah. that, that intentional creating a life that feels good for you, both inside and outside of parenting is like a little, like a glowing shield. It doesn't yes. mean that the judgment and the criticism won't get to you and you get to feel sad and mad as we discussed when somebody really makes a nasty comment or you fall in with militant, mil a militant group of yes, parents. Yeah. So, so we're, we're, we're not saying those things aren't real or that you won't feel them, but I feel like that sort of buffer shield um, is strengthened by having this rich life of a bunch of different things that make you happy and float your boat. So, yeah. um, that's really hard in the early years. It's really, it really hard. But, but you know what I think is another good analogy if we're doing, you know, uh, metaphors and yeah. analogies is the one about putting the big rocks in first. Yes. So I'm sure you've heard, like, if you have a jar and you want to fill it with rocks, you got to fill it, put in the big rocks first, because yep. if you put all the little stuff and, and I, I count, people's opinions about your parenting as a little rock. Yep. Maybe it's something to think about, but it's definitely not a priority. Yes. If you start throwing the little rocks in the jar, they're going to take up a lot of space and you won't have room for the big rocks. Yep. You don't have room for the stuff that matters. But if you put the big rocks in first and that's how you feel about yourself as a mom, self-care, um, you know, having that life outside of just thinking about mom stuff all the time and, and prioritizing. Yeah. Then you can kind of sprinkle the little rocks in. I love that. And it reminds me that we've talked about this too, that you don't have to, not every issue has to be a big rock for you. <laughs> no, that was like a big realization. I think for both you and me is like, you don't yeah. have to care equally about all the things you get. To I would have, argue that you can't care. Equally no, you about can't. And it's much more fun and a lot more freeing to have a few big rocks and then have the other ones be like, yeah, sometimes I do it this way. Sometimes I do it this way. It's not a hill yeah. I'm going to die on as we like to yes. say. Um, so yeah. I and and Sarah, to your point earlier about like, how do you have conversations with other people with so that they don't, how can you share about what you're doing or do what you're doing in front of people without them starting to feel uh, judged, yeah. you know, or like, yeah, I think that when you, cr there's a quiet confidence that comes from putting the big rocks in and deciding yes. what's important to you and then just living your life yes. and filling your time that really resonates with people. And and I, I am guessing that the more confident I've become as a mom, the more confident I've helped other moms yes. feel, even if they do things completely differently from me, they would probably never know. Or even if they did know, it wouldn't be a thing it's because a it would be so like, it's a non-issue. It's just like, yeah, that's what I do. Or, or even I don't even have to say it. It yeah. just is what I do. It doesn't need to be commented on. And sometimes the less we have to comment on everything, the yeah. better. So it's, it's it's not easy to get to that stage, especially when you're in the part where you're so immersed in what you're yeah. doing and because it's like new and important and you're not sure of yourself, but yeah. like working toward getting to that point where it's just casual. It yeah. just is. It doesn't yep. have to be a thing all the time. Yep. Um, I think that that comes out in ways you probably don't even know yep. and, and helps other people feel comfortable too. So Absolutely. the more you can radiate that, I think the better, like you're helping other yes, moms, you are. Really. You're creating a great parenting culture. And yeah. I believe that's out there. I, th I think there is mom judging and mom shaming out there. But I also really do believe there's there's some of this good stuff out there, too. And yeah, I think no, our I listeners agree. are the ones that are helping create that. Um, OK, so before we wrap up, this is kind of exciting. So we have partnered with PRX and Gen Z Media to tell you guys about a great new podcast. Wait for it for kids. Oh, my so gosh. My kids love podcasts and it's summertime. And so to me, podcasts and audiobooks are kind of like the anti screen time. Like, no, you yeah. can't watch TV. But if you need to chill out, here's some headphones. So this podcast is called Pants on Fire, and it's a great concept. So it's a nonfiction podcast, and it brings on two quote unquote experts, one real expert on a topic like pizza or sharks or space travel, 
they're both adults. They bring them on. One is a real expert and one is totally full of baloney. Now, my kid, this is like a perfect <laughs> for my kids age range because kids, kids need to know that kids need to have critical thinking about right. the, the, what they're hearing. But this turns it into almost like game show fun. Like, can right. you spot the baloney, um, which I think <laughs> I think is actually like a really seriously great skill for kids to have in our current. They need it. Yes, environment, absolutely. but totally fun and fun for the whole family. So they learn about topics while having fun, kind of playing along and trying to figure out if they can spot the fake. So there are new episodes every Thursday. And where you find this podcast is bestrobotever.com. The podcast is called Pants on Fire. And again, it's from PRX and our friends at Gen Z Media. So go check that out. If your kids are home and bored, put on Pants on Fire and you'll have a lot of fun. All right. So All right. Megan, we're going to queue it up for our listeners to go right. uh, listen to another of our shows. We like to end the show this way so you can scroll right down and keep listening to the mom hour. And I picked episode 62 from August of 2016. So almost two years ago. And it's called things we shouldn't have freaked out about starting school edition. Um, I think we should, we should revisit that series. So we did. Well, I was going to say, this is probably one of our more popular series, right? It Um, is. Things we shouldn't have freaked out about. Yeah. Yeah. And like basically our entire podcast is things we shouldn't have freaked out about because we have the benefit (laughs) of hindsight, but things we shouldn't have freaked out about is where you and I go back and forth about things we took super seriously way back in the day that we now realize aren't a big deal. Um, And the starting school edition is specifically for you guys out there who are, have a preschooler starting for the first time, or maybe are transitioning to kinder or even a school change. I mean, starting a new school year, um, if you're making any kind of a change brings up some of these things, but I would say choosing a school, yeah, choosing a school. So especially if you have an entering a rising preschooler or a rising kinder, and I know there's so weird about that term, but it doesn't make sense. Um, (laughs) Then this is my pick for you guys. So again, it's from August of 2016. Just scroll back in your podcast app and look for episode 62. It's called Things We Shouldn't Have Freaked Out About Starting School Edition. And I know it feels a little early, but I, if you're a worrier, then you're already worried about the first week of school. And like, you yeah. know, what the the list that they've sent home about the change of clothes and if your kid's going to be potty trained in time. And so I know, I, I see you, I hear you, I feel you. <laughs> so I don't think it's too early for us to help uh, back you off of that ledge. Um, so go check that out. And then, yeah, stay around because Katie's up next with me and we will talk to you guys soon. Bye. Hey guys, it's Sarah again, and I am here with Katie Addis. Hey Katie. Hi Sarah. So Katie joins me once a month to give us a little peek into her life as a mom of two little ones. So she has a three and a half year old and gosh, an almost two year old at this point. Oh my goodness. Yes. Crazy. So So crazy. Yeah. So we always do something that's going really well, something that's maybe a struggle and then a little tip or hack or discovery. So Katie, what do we have today? Okay, so today we are talking about Luke's skin, oh. his little poor patchy skin. <laughs> um, so he has eczema in very um, small areas, Okay, but it is chronic. Yeah. And now going on almost two years, we thought that, um, you know, once he reached a certain milestone, physically it wouldn't be as straining on his skin Mm -hmm. because for for example like where he gets it um is on the back of his leg kind Mm -hmm. of above his um kind of hamstring area and then on the side of his ankle Hmm. so if you think about a crawling baby and where those skin folds are it's basically that back of the leg skin fold and so we always figured oh well once he's up walking around he's going to alleviate that stress on that skin area but um you know to no avail no nothing has helped basically we treat it topically Mm -hmm. with the uh, medical grade hydrocortisone Mm -hmm. cream so it's like that that. two and a half percent and I just I'm kind of the point where I'm just sick of when it gets when it flares up I'm just sick of medicating it topically I just think there has to be a different source of this allergy or something yeah. like I, I think it might be allergies. Yeah. Um, I have brought up allergy testing to his pediatrician before and she kind of um, dismisses that as an option and really pushes just for topical treatment. Interesting. Yeah. And I think um, it's always been, I think because of his age though, because uh-huh. I think 
either it's harder to determine allergies in a younger yes, baby I, and and or um allergies come and go yeah. I don't know yeah in under two or something I did hear something about that like once they turn two allergies are more definitive have you heard something like yeah, that? yeah I feel like I, yeah and I'm not really a huge expert on allergies and kids I do know seasonal allergies like hay fever types they say they don't even really develop until they're between three and five and that I have heard from more than one person it's not that your kid might not be having an allergic reaction if they're sniffling or the the wind is blowing or the weather changing, but like true seasonal allergies, like if you're like a hay fever spring allergy sufferer, right. that, that doesn't typically develop till later. So I would believe that things are in flux with babies and toddlers. Mm-hmm. Um, we've dealt with eczema, but on a more mild scale and everybody grew out of it in the toddler years, I would say. I do. I mean, you do hear that it can be food related though, right? Like I just, I'm not an expert, but like definitely probably worth pursuing. Right. So I'm just thinking one of the big culprits that other kids suffer from, like maybe it's gluten, maybe it's dairy. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe I should just enjoy the months leading up to this final. Right? Like you might down. actually be just wishing for hoarder, hydrocortisone 2.5% exactly. if you were facing. I know that you're going to hear from listeners on this. So if you guys have severe eczema sufferers and or kids whose dietary allergies have led to skin issues, I know that we have people like that. So maybe you'll get a flood of emails with tips. Yeah, that'd be great. Is it worse seasonally? Is it? No, it's just kind of always, always chronic. There's yeah. there's not one trigger that we can pinpoint environmentally. Yeah. I mean, and then his that one second patch that I mentioned is down by his ankle. Um, and that's where every shoe yeah. basically rubs. Yeah. And so it's pretty um unavoidable. Yeah. Maybe both. summer, maybe this summer being a toddler running around, can he wear sandals or like less well, shoey this, shoes? <sighs> um <laughs> okay, I have this terrible reaction to this comment here because sandals and um I don't know under two year olds like flip flop yeah. sandals with the little yeah. ankle yeah. back strap. Did you ever no, use those? Not really, because they don't they don't work right. Like the ankle strap just comes off their. I I had some their toddlers heel. who would wear those, but they were probably more like two and a half before I put them in those little flip flops. And I always feel like it's a fall risk too. Like yeah. little kids in flip flops does make me nervous. I mean they're adorable and they. But I just feel like I, they just don't work. Yeah. And they'll fall off his foot. Yeah. yeah. So there's really not an option. It's yeah. either topical treatment or get to the bottom of what's yeah. causing we'll it. Keep us posted. Okay. Um. So let's see. Moving on to a. Ooh. Okay. I'm excited about this one. This is a discovery. And moms, hopefully it'll inspire some make ahead meals for mm-hmm. for you or your kids. So I'm excited, Sarah, to hear your reaction to this. Um, do you like tuna? No. <laughs> I like ahi tuna. I like sushi tuna. Okay. Um, but I do not like canned tuna. What about fish tacos? I like fish tacos. And I like all other fish. Okay. So this is a fish taco sauce okay. that I parlayed into a tuna tuna salad yeah. yeah I mean and my husband likes tuna salad like I can I I just you can don't eat it but I, I keep going okay. I'm with you okay so I, I like all other seafood so maybe use this fish taco sauce as a gateway you know get on get on board with this fish taco sauce it is amazing literally I've made many fish taco sauces before this is the one I think I've landed on that nice. I will keep forever um it's got well, it, okay, so you blend everything, all the ingredients in a food processor, and it's heavy on the cilantro. I love cilantro. You have some jalapeno nice. in there. Yep. And then a, just a little bit of cumin. Okay. I actually cut the amount of cumin that the recipe, mm-hmm. um, I always kind of cut cumin because it's so strong. Right. But, and then is it mayo based? So it's half mayo, half um, Greek yogurt. Yep. I didn't have Greek yogurt one time I made it. So I used sour cream. That yeah. was great. Greek yogurt, of course, is a little bit healthier sure. and you have the added health benefit of the probiotic right. and stuff. Um, so it, oh, so good. So, so I had so much of the sauce though. Mm-hmm. And so that's how it ended up getting parlayed into the tuna. I do think with tuna, um, if you're a little skeptical or like could take it or leave it, I think if you buy higher quality yeah. canned tuna, it's less fishy and less, I would believe that. I yeah. would think at this point, it's almost like a mental thing with me. Like, yeah, but I do like chicken salad. I do like 
you know, I could, I could see like using that type of a sauce on a bunch of different things. Yeah. I would love if yeah. any listeners out there are interested in this sauce, so, but try it on chicken salad. I'd yeah. love to know. Yeah. Tag us on social media. Um, yeah, I would love that. Um, did you get the recipe somewhere? Is this something we can link up? Or are oh, we just yeah. Gonna, okay. Yeah. So we'll link up the recipe and then we'll throw in the modifications that yeah. I did in terms of quantity and then cutting on some of the um, Okay. So that will all be at the momhour.com, you guys, in the show notes for this episode. And if I forget, just yell at me in the comments. That happens quite, <laughs> especially with our segment. Because I like, I sometimes we record separately. Yeah. And so I forget. And then if, yeah, if I forget to ask you. So it will be there, guys. If you're the first one there and it's not there, you get the privilege okay. of reminding me. It's my homework too, Sarah. <laughs> okay. So my last thing is a success that I've had with just memorabilia management. I like that term. Yes. And uh, for kids specifically. So I am big into memorabilia. I actually used to do quite a bit of scrapbooking Mm -hmm. and crafting and that's fallen to the wayside a little bit with kids. I've been doing other things. Um, but I, um, do feel proud about the way that I have managed their stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically I have a big Sterilite tub Yep. and this is after doing lots of research of Mm -hmm. what sort of tub I wanted. I knew I wanted it to be waterproof. Okay. Um, I knew that I wanted it to stand the distance of, you know, stand the test of time. So I want this to take them from K to 12, Mm -hmm. essentially. I've just, you know, the paperwork stuff that you want to keep. Um, and so this particular size, I think it's all about the size and, um, you know, those qualities Mm -hmm. like waterproof and blah, blah, blah. Um, so this can accommodate both letter and legal size, depending okay. on which way you flip the orientation mm-hmm. of the, of the file. And basically what I've done for each kid for every year, um, is starting with, well, they have one folder per calendar year. And okay. then once they start preschool, they have an additional file for that the school year yeah. for the school year. Exactly. So calendar year, school mm-hmm. year, um, going all the way up. And I may, I did a, just a batch um, a batch box. So like all the years are mm-hmm. there because I know it would be so like me to have, oh, you know, one yellow folder and then right. it's next nice to year. have it all look the same. And, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. love the uniformity. So, um, so their boxes are taken nice. care of. And the one thing that actually listeners, if you too are into memorabilia management, um, do you have a tub out there that also has a handle that, that would be nice that also can accommodate. I feel um, like we also need a picture of yours. Um, yeah, oh yeah, I mean, I'll, I can picture it. And I think just for comparison's sake, since my kids are older, I have these accordion folders that they sell for this purpose. Okay. I'll show you on your way out. Okay. Katie's at my house and they're in the garage. And my oldest will finish fourth grade this year. Um, and I would say they are mostly holding up. What I like about them is they're really big. So like the preschool projects that are like awkwardly sized or like oversized, uh-huh. that's no problem. The oh, jury's still out on whether the accordion is truly going to stretch to accommodate, I guess this one, I'm trying to think if this is meant to go up through 12th grade or maybe like sixth, either way they, you can carry them by a handle, but they are not waterproof. So it's, this would just be different. It's not yeah. like better or worse, but I'll show them to you. And they, I do like them for larger art projects. And I will say that the like preschool and kinder and first years tend to be like the thickest because the stuff they're bringing home sometimes has like macaroni on it or like tissue paper balls Mm -hmm. and and it it has accommodated those I think it gets thinner as they get older which is not a bad thing I think you know yeah I I think this thing will stretch and it will work but Allegra's is getting fat so stretch in terms of so it's like an accordion on the side so if you picture like yeah like a like an accordion file folder but it's giant I'm using my hands right now okay like really big okay um so listeners since you can't see us um I'll post a link to those and I've talked about them I think in another episode of this podcast and then Katie will post a picture yeah do you ruthlessly filter yeah so what I usually do is when the stuff comes home at the end of the year from school or maybe the end of the semester um so I have a I have a file folder on my desk in the kitchen that's pretty small. So if there's a one-off piece I want to save, it goes in there under their name. But then the the final resting place is in this big folder, which lives in the garage. And then at the end of the year, um, yeah, I'm pretty ruthless. Like, I mean, I get yeah. rid of a lot. I usually kind of let it sit on the counter for a couple weeks while yeah. I don't deal with it. And then by the time I'm ready to deal with it, I'm in that 
purging mode. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I'll do is once a year or so, I'll go through the past years. And mm-hmm. even then I might purge a little bit more because I might realize like, okay, with the hindsight of two years, there's a lot that's similar. You know, maybe it's like, I love their early writing, like in kindergarten and first and even second grade, their little pieces of writing. But then you start to realize like, okay, well, there's several in here that are similar. So I'm going to pare down. So yeah, I, yeah I, I, I definitely edit. And it's, it's satisfying to edit because then what you're left with is really memorable. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And that's only for the paper mem- memorabilia. A different episode, we can talk about other big objects like first birthday hat. Yeah, you know what I, mean? I do have like a couple bins like right. one, my people who go in my garage make fun of me because one just says baby stuff sentimental don't lose or something like, yeah like, like it's not it's not organized yeah um but I feel like I know where it is and it's in one place and yeah, yeah I have like the hats they wore home from the hospital and mm-hmm. yeah you know, all that stuff but it's not it's not overly organized but I know where it is and it's safe that's, that's all that matters thing. and it's all in one I would say two bins there's one in the garage and then there's one in our youngest's bedroom which was you know the baby room there's no more babies but it's like multiple baby items in a bin in Violet's closet. So I feel decent about that. I don't feel it's like an A plus game. Well, this is not to put stress on any of the listeners. No, I would love to hear how people, I mean, I think for some people truly enjoy this, enjoy the organizational aspect of it, which is awesome. Yeah. But if you don't, I think that's fine. If you, if you have a way, I'm pretty sure Megan just has like literally a bin for each kid and it's not even I'm not throwing her under the bus, but I want to say it's not, it's not even organized by year. It's just like, this is Jacob's bin. Let's look through it. Let's Mm -hmm. see all these art projects. Most of them probably have the the date on them anyway. You know, I don't think there's one right way. I think if you like to geek out over the organizational aspect, then that's fun. But if you don't, it's fine. Yeah. It's all going to be okay. All right, Katie, should we wrap up? Yep. Sounds good. Okay. So we'll be back in a month or so with Katie and head to the momhour.com because we did actually mention some things we'll link up there. Um, So just head to the show notes for this episode and you will find what you're looking for. Thanks, Katie. Bye guys. 